So, apologies to those of you who've been uh, been waiting the last uh, the last five minutes. Thank you very much for your patience and uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Marcus Bates. I'm the chief executive of the British Pig Association. Uh, with me this evening, we've got uh, Faye Merch from Kingsgate Nutrition and Tony Bales from the AHDB. And this is the second in a series of uh, seminars that AHDB are providing specifically for small scale producers. And uh, when I say that, that's all small scale producers. This isn't a program that's limited to members of the British Pig Association. It's uh, it's open to uh, open to all. The first of these uh, was about feeding co-products. You know, everybody, you're all very well aware of the uh, the problem that we have at the moment with the massive increase in feed prices, and it's a huge challenge for uh, for all producers, both big and small. So the first meeting that we had, Faye talked us through how you can feed co-products, how you can do this safely and uh, to ensure that nobody's tempted to break the swill ban. We've got enough problems to deal with at the moment with the cost of living crisis, inflation, feed prices through the roof, energy prices through the roof. We certainly don't need an outbreak of African swine fever to, uh, to top it off. So first message from our first seminar was be safe. This evening, Faye's going to talk to us in more detail about making the best use of the expensive concentrate that you've still got to buy to, uh, to feed your pigs. And so she's going to talk us through uh, how you can get the best out of that and use it as efficiently as possible, bearing in mind it's uh, incredibly high price. Uh, we're very grateful to Tony and the HDB for, for, for putting these, uh, these seminars on. Uh, the HDB have uh, a series, uh, have a meeting on the 10th where they'll be um, introducing and explaining how the, uh, the levy that all pig producers in England pay to the HDB, how that's going to be used in the future. And that meeting for the pork se sector is at four o'clock in the afternoon. If you want to register for that, if you go to the HDB website, you'll find links through there to, uh, to join that meeting. If if you want. Faye's going to take us now through the meeting. She's going to do her presentation and then take questions at the end. So if you can make a note of your questions and then and then uh, she'll deal with, uh, with them, there'll be time at the end of the presentation for those. So with that, I'll uh, hand over to you, Faye, and uh, let you make a start. Thank you very much, everybody. Well, thank you very much for inviting me back again. Um, it was very kind of you. Um, so tonight, yep, we're going to talk about making the most of the expensive feed, but specifically for the growing and finishing herds, um, which is where the bulk of uh, most of you will be spending your feed. So we're going to talk about what is growth? How do pigs grow? How does feed affect growth? What should a pig look like? Which I'm hoping you all know after the last lecture what compound feed to use, some what-if scenarios and questions at the end. So from this, I think it's really important that at the beginning we learn what, we, what the pig is requiring and therefore how we can then feed that pig at the end. So what is growth? What is growth? Most people would make some common guesses, getting bigger, being more mature, laying down muscle and fat. Yeah, that's, that's all very accurate. But from a pig point of view, what's a pig after? A pig's objective is to reach a mature size to be able to breed. Now that actually requires um, protein deposition or muscle mass. So it's actually the muscle mass that the breeding pig requires for breeding. It would will require some fat, but it's the the critical point is the protein deposition. From a producer point of view, you need growth to create a saleable product. Now, all of these things are correct. All of these things are right. They all be um, imparting growth, but they're all slightly different. And it's our job to try and make the most of them, to make them 
compatible so that we end up with the correct product for you guys to sell at the end of it. So what is growth? If we have a look at this chart, everything, all pigs grow in a very similar way. They follow this sigmoidal growth curve, which is here at the beginning of their lives at farrowing. They grow slowly and then they speed up in gaining live weight until they reach their um, genetic size. Yes, they can get bigger and get fatter and fatter, as a lot of you may well know, but this is generally the shape of the curve. It's actually very similar for most animals on the planet, um, so they're all pretty much similar. But what is growth? Do different pigs grow at different rates? You know, does, does one breed of pig go, grow the same as another breed of pig? Yeah, they do. So they all follow a very similar growth curve. But we might have a smaller breed of pig here, breed B, compared to a middle-sized breed of pig, pig A, and an exceptionally large breed of pig, pig C. So they all reach their live weight, some of them at similar points, so they might all grow and reach the same end point, their maximum live weight at the same point in time. Or if we look at pig D, A and E, these are all growing to be the same size, so they might all be the same breed of pig, but breed D is growing faster because it's reaching its live weight, its maximum live weight, faster at a quicker time point than pig A or pig E. Now, as a producer, what you're really wanting is to produce a pig like pig D, is to get it to this point as quickly as we can, as cheaply as we can, so that we don't have to feed as many days of feed to that pig. So all pigs grow in a similar way. But how does a pig grow? That's what growing is, but how does a pig grow? So it doesn't matter what breed of pig we look at, this is all pretty universal. We start off here at birth, they're all very much growing in the same way. They've all got to lay down bone. They've all got to grow muscle mass and they're all going to grow fat. When we look at them early on down here, they're all growing in a similar rate, but we've got more and more protein deposition, muscle buildup going on in these early time frames compared to later. As the pigs get older, they're much more inclined to lay down fat. Now I'm sure you guys know this than a lot of commercial breeders because you see it a lot more in the breeds of pig that you're rearing. So as we get to this age, this old age, the ability to lay down fat just grows and grows and grows. So from a production point of view, we need to make sure that we're making the most of this growth rate here when we don't have to be concerned about as much body fat being put down. Now, I know you probably are going to shout at me because you're all very specific breeders and producers and your meat requires a good muscle uh, fat deposition. Absolutely right, I'm not going to argue with that. But what I do want you to think about is the muscle growth that you have to have around or before that fat deposition or along with that fat deposition. If we don't get enough lean deposition, then it doesn't matter what you do, you just end up with a fat pig with less protein deposition in amongst it. So just to make sure you're all awake really early on, I thought I'd put something really complicated in, <clears throat> uh, just because I really like it more than anything else. So this is quite complex. It was just really to highlight that when a pig is growing, it isn't just growing muscle and fat and bone. It is in fact growing a stomach, it's stomach capacity. So when it's really small, it might sound obvious, but a small pig has a small stomach. A big pig has a much bigger stomach. It's been growing that stomach capacity for quite some time. It's the same with the muscle deposition. A small pig has only certain capacity for, that, for a small amount of muscle. So it's got to grow that muscle very rapidly. And if we look at adipose tissue, that's a posh word for fat deposition. This adipose tissue is growing and growing and growing. It's the last thing that really peaks out here. 
So as a producer, it's our job to know how these pigs are growing, what it is that they are growing, and what we want them to look like. So <clears throat> I want to introduce you to a couple of key concepts to understand how pigs are growing and to make the most of them grow. I'm sure some of you will have heard of these and I apologise if it's a bit basic, but I think it's very important that we grab these concepts to understand what is happening to our livestock. So the first one is daily live weight gain. So daily live weight gain is the kilograms of pig is growing per day, okay? So all pigs follow a growth, a daily live weight gain curve such as this. Um, the, the daily live weight gain and the month time scale is irrelevant to you guys, but it just gives you some concept. So this would be half a kilo per day. So this pig is maxing out at about 600 grams per day it's gaining. And if we think about it, when we had that young pig, it was very small, so it can't grow that much because it's got a small stomach, it's very small in size. And so the rate it's got to grow is actually quite big. If we put our growth curve on there as well, so that you can see what I'm talking about, when we hit this peak growth period here, this marries to this peak daily live weight gain here. And if we remember our lean and fat deposition, as we get to the fat deposition over this side here, our daily live weight gain is starting to slow down. It is quite complicated to grasp, but I think the key thing to remember is that a small pig is growing very rapidly in relation to its size, but on a kilogram basis per day, it's actually quite slow. But look at that rise. I mean, the speed with which these pigs can grow, all breeds of pig is quite amazing. So the next concept, is, which is slightly difficult, um, and I know that pigs that you're producing are higher in fat than commercials, but this is also quite key for you guys as well when we think about a, a, the pig's point of view of what is growth. So daily lean gain. Okay, so daily lean gain is the kilograms of lean meat deposition per day. So lean meat deposition means protein. Protein means the muscle fibres that you're putting onto your pig. Okay, I know that you want to grow fat as well, but as we spoke about at the very beginning, pigs want to grow protein because their whole objective in life is to reach puberty. And to do that, they need the muscle mass to be able to achieve that. So pigs, this is where they have a genetic potential, which you may have heard of. So they have a daily lean growth rate. So there's a maximum amount of lean that your pig can put on on a daily basis. They might be putting on a higher live weight gain. So this pig marries up to the pig we saw before, whose actual daily live weight gain is 600 grams. But if we remember our very complicated picture, it's growing in stomach mass, it's growing in heart, it's growing in intestines, it's growing a lot of things all at the same time. This graph is purely about the amount of muscle it can put on in one day for that pig. So some breeds of pig will have a lower daily lean growth rate than other pigs. So what that means is it is our job, if we're going to be efficient at growing this pig, to make sure that we're giving it every opportunity to reach its genetic potential. Alongside growing the fat, I, I haven't written that off as well, but we're gonna come on to that later alongside growing the fat so that you get a really good quality product, but we're trying to chase this speed of growth so that we can get them fed as efficiently as possible. I'm gonna come on to how you're gonna grow them efficiently and why it's efficient to grow them um, faster in a little while. So you just have to bear with me, okay. So just to ram it right home to you, this, Key is speed of lean growth is the key to cost effective pig production. Moving our pig daily live weight gain from an E to a D is what is going to save us money on the feeding of that pig. 
There are a few other issues that we're going to cover as well, but that is the key point. We're going to grow them as fast as possible. Okay, so that's the basic groundwork. Um, you may well get bored of this graph by the time I've finished with you, but um, I think you got bored of body condition scoring last time. So just traded it for a different version. So we're going to move on to how does feed affect growth? Okay, this is where it starts to get slightly more complicated. I've tried to break it down a little bit for you. So the first concept, which again, some of you may have heard of, others may not, is feed conversion ratio, FCR. Sometimes in America, it's called FCE, feed conversion efficiency. And then we're just going to look at protein and energy, the two key concepts of the feed, which we did talk about we talked about energy and fiber last time in our co-product discussion, but this time I just want to bring in what the protein is doing as well. So we're going to start with the feed conversion ratio. So what is feed conversion ratio? Basically, in very basic concept, it's how much you put in to what you get out. So if you put in one kilogram of feed, you get one kilogram of pig, the FCR, the feed conversion ratio is one to one, okay? That would be great. If the feed conversion ratio is two to one, you get two kilograms of feed produces one kilogram of pig, okay? I'm hoping you can all do the last one on your own. If the food conversion ratio is three to one, that's it, three kilograms of feed equates to one kilogram of pig. OK, pigs don't grow at one rate. We've just seen that. And it's the same for the feed conversion ratio. OK, so if pigs could grow at one to one all the way through their lives, my gosh, you'd all be millionaires. Unfortunately, they don't. They do grow at one to one ratio when they're on this on the sow in the first couple of weeks of life. But that doesn't last long, unfortunately. So the smaller the pig, generally, the lower the feed conversion ratio. So a low feed conversion ratio is one to one. A high feed conversion ratio could be three to one. And basically, as this pig gets older, the feed conversion ratio increases. Now, I found it very difficult to find feed conversion ratio for your um, rare breeds. So I've taken some off one of my commercial units who's agreed to share some of his data with you. So this is a commercial breed unit. I've taken this one because they do actually wean at about 10 kilos, which I thought was a little bit more relevant. So between these points, the, the farm measures the weight of the pigs and they move accommodation. So between 10 and 20 kilos live weight, their pigs are growing with a food conversion ratio of one and a half. So that's one and a half kilos of feed to create one kilo of pig. As we move up, they're going to create, they get a higher and higher FCR until at this very high weights, which I'm not sure if you're reaching, but these very high weights, they're reaching a two and a half feed conversion ratio, FCR, okay? If we put our growth curve alongside this, you can see how it marries up. So you can see how as the pig grows, the FCR is increasing. Okay, but it's not quite as simple as that because nothing ever is. This is the, the FCR for my commercial unit for the last six months. This is his most recent data for the last six months. But six months previously, this was his FCR, this red one. And in this 50 to 90 stage, can you see how that shoots up this FCR here? So it drops off here, which might look good, but it increases here and it stays high all the way along. And the reason for that is the pigs were poorly. So they were a bit under the weather, which wasn't really great. And then if I put the growth rates on top of this, you can see here, so the black line was when they did well, the last six months, but the six months previous when the growers were poorly, 
in this green line, you can see how the daily live weight gains dropped off. So although the FCR is lower here, which sounds like a good thing, it's because they've slowed down growing. And the reason they slowed down growing is they got poorly here and they were quite sick here and then they're starting to improve and then they're not too bad. But they never recover that daily live weight gain and they never recover that FCR back to where they were before. Now I've done this as a representation when the pigs were poorly, but that could be anything. For you guys, it could be sleep, wind and rain, a lack of ability to get food, a bag of mouldy feed, it could be anything. And this uh, next slide that uh, is on AHDB website actually, even Tony was surprised I managed to find this, um, kind of highlights what I'm talking about. So the fee conversion ratio here is impacted by all these things around this circle. So you might think some of these are um, valid to you guys and some may not be, but really we have to go around each individual one to see if there's anything else we can do. Welfare status, you know, are the pigs having to wade through a foot of mud to get to food and water troughs? Have we done everything in our power to make sure that the pigs have got a really good, well-developed gut health? Because uh, the stomach and the digestive system is the first line of defence for disease. Have we got a great weaning weight? Have we made our sows work well in order to produce a good quality piglet to um, send to finishers or for us to produce ourselves? Our management systems, have we got a well bedded down, um, well covered, draft free bed for these pigs to lie in? Now, on a night like tonight, when it's uh, slightly wet and rainy here in Nottinghamshire, quite vital to keep them warm because otherwise they're spending food and energy on keeping warm, not on growing. Health status, we've seen if that can impact on um, the FCR and the daily live weight gain because the pigs are raising an immune response. So they're spending energy on trying to make themselves better. Feed formulation, we're gonna come on to. Stocking density, I'm really hoping that's not an issue for your guy, you guys. Storage and handling of food, yeah, really important. Um, we did a little bit of that on the co-product talk. Moldy feed, are rats eating the food, are mice eating the food, anything along those lines. Genetics, absolutely different lines produce different speeds of growth and different abilities to reach the correct FCR. And environmental conditions, you know, mud, wind, rain, snow, ice, all of that jazz. Okay, so fee conversion ratio is impacted by every aspect of your pig keeping skill. It's a very skillful job and it has to, it's a tick box exercise, making sure that you're doing everything right. So I can hear you all yelling, why the hell is Faye so focused on this fee conversion ratio? Now, good old AHDB produced another really good slide. I did ask Tony if there was um, a newer version, um, but unfortunately they haven't really done the exercise currently, but I'm hoping that they might after this. This was taken from September 2018, when fee costs were substantially lower than they are now. Probably, nearly half of what they were now today, or maybe last week because they come down a little bit today. Um, this is really quite crucial. The effect of changing FCR on overall cost of production for farrow to finish. So the finishing herd here, going from a food conversion ratio of about 2.2 up to 3.2. So an increase of just one FCR has added in old terminology, a good 20 odd P. So you could say a good 50 pence on the cost of production, pence per kilogram of pig. So that's, if you're producing a hundred kilogram pig, that's 50 pounds. The rearing is not quite so as dramatic, but it still is increasing in cost. It's a huge cost. It's the first thing that we look at FCR and daily live weight gain, the two that correspond together. So FCR, huge impact on your profit. But the other two things that I really want you to think about as well is it does have a massive effect on our planet. 
we should be, and you guys should be, because you're pushing sustainability, pushing for environmentally friendly and sustainable production. If we could get all pigs to finish on a one-to-one -one fee conversion ratio, the reduction on the impact on our planet would be huge, absolutely huge. It's, also, it's impacting on your profits just because of the amount of money that you're going to be spending on the feed if the FCR is going up. But it also impacts on the people. It impacts on you with your profit and it impacts on the planet and the people. So from a marketing point of view, you can then be marketing on a very good principles of high welfare, high sustainability. And in my view, it doesn't matter whether you're feeding them turnips or concentrate feed. It's all feed and it's all an impact on the planet. So as my job as a nutritionist, I try very hard to work to improve all of those aspects. So that's FCR nearly done to death. Let's move on to protein and energy. Now I've gone about this in a slightly different way to try and break it down to something that's a little bit more comprehensive. So I'm hoping you all know what this looks like. This is a piece of bacon and it's a 100 gram piece of bacon. That's a great piece of bacon. And it's from Colin Whittemore in 1980. Now, I have to say, I think he's exceptionally optimistic that you could produce a 100 gram piece of bacon with 210 kilograms of feed back in the 1980s or even now. But I'll run with that. I can run with that. That's no problem. So let's have a look at this piece of bacon. We're going to break it down into two parts. First of all, we've got the fatty tissue. So we've got this 100 grams of bacon, we've got 33 grams of fatty tissue. And of that 100 grams of bacon, we've got 66, or you could say 67, but this is from Colin, so 66 kilograms uh, grams of lean tissue. Okay, so what is fat made of? I'm not sure if any of you know, so I thought I'd have a little look at it. So fatty tissue is made up of some protein, fat, obviously, and some water, a little bit of water. So this is quite expensive to produce. Lean tissue, the meat section, the protein, is made up of, oh look, quite a lot of protein, actually quite a lot of fat. So when we're building this muscle, we are building fat. I know you didn't believe me earlier. I'm hoping you're going to believe me now. And your pigs decipher how much fat they're going to put in, partly through their genetic makeup and partly from the feed. But then look at this. Lean tissue is made up of masses of water. And water is the cheapest nutrient that you can buy, especially if you um, have a borehole or collect rainwater. I don't know um, if uh, many of you do that. So what's the be all and end all? What's Faye getting at? is the feed that, make, that we need to produce this fat. So if you remember, we've got 210 grams of the feed and 130 grams of that feed creates the fat. And only 80 grams of that feed is required to make 66 grams of lean. To put that into alternative terms, if you think of it as batteries, Duracell batteries, because batteries is energy, and all of this fat here is energy. It takes three and a quarter little Duracell batteries compared to one Duracell battery to produce this lean tissue, okay? So I'm not telling you to not grow fat, that's not what I'm saying, but I just want you to be really aware as to how much energy, how much Cost, if you think of each of these costing 50p, how many of these batteries you require to build fat, okay? So what we need you to do to be an effective, cost-effective producer is to work out what target fat do you require. I don't know what it is for your specific breeds of pig or for your target markets, but if you are marketing your pigs on the commercial side, you might be looking for a 12 millimetre back fat or a 40 millimetre back fat, something along those lines. You have your target. 
everything above that target is costing you money. You're putting batteries and batteries and batteries in here that you're literally stuffing in the cupboard and never going to use, which is very expensive, both for the environment, for your pocket, and unnecessary for the pig and the market. Okay, so that's me ramming home that fat good, yes, but know what it is that you want your pig to look like. So what should a pig look like? I know you're going to be really bored when you see these slides if you watched the last session. So we all know what a good pig looks like. Nice confirmation, great. Never really see a pig from the side. I'm always looking at this back end of this pig, body condition score. I know we went on about it last time, but it is so important. It is really important when you're growing pigs to make sure you have the right condition score of the pig. The body condition score system is a one to five system. One where the pig is emaciated. Three, perfect. That is a beautiful back end of a pig. We love that pig. That is cost effective. It's the healthiest pig. It's perfect. We're starting to get fat here in, in condition score four and obese in condition score five. Basically, you've got to see this pig as wrapped up in AA batteries, far too much fat, wrapped up in AA batteries and going to roll in the mud in it, doing absolutely no good for anybody. So let's think about our growers. I know this is repeating what we did in the last session, but worth going over again. An emaciated pig, if it's grower and finisher, it's going to cost us extra money to produce. It's going to take us longer to finish. It's going to be far too lean for your market. It's going to be a terrible eating quality because there's no fat wraps around it. It's an increased disease risk. So it's going to get poorly. It's going to be ill. It's going to get cold really quickly because it's got no insulation. That means it's going to be really expensive to finish. If we go to our growth curves again, this pig, if, you, if it's an e, um, a body condition score number one, it's not just going to be an E, it's probably going to be an F or a G. It's going to be over here. It's ridiculous. And if we look at the FCR on that pig on body condition score number one, if you remember, this was the body condition score of our average six months for our commercial unit. This was when his pigs were poorly. This is probably where the body condition score is going to be for our body condition score number one. This is where our FCR is going to be. I know Tony disagrees with me. And he thinks I've under-egged it. He thinks the body condition score of one would push that FCR up even higher from his experience. So um, I, I was being probably a little bit more optimistic for him. So going to an obese pig, we've got a similar problem, but at the other end of the scale. You've just pumped batteries and batteries into her. She's costing extra money from the overfeeding. She's so fatty for the market. Um, it's, you're not going to get as much bang for your buck. There's not as much protein in her because she's basically not known what to do with all that energy. So she's just laid fat and hasn't bothered laying down that protein on the other side of our piece of bacon. She is also going to be very expensive to finish. And when you see this one, what I want you to remember is this one here. All these extra batteries being pumped into this bit here when she's far too fat for what you need for selling or indeed breeding. This is what we're aiming for. Condition score number three, the whole way, a really great pig bottom. Just to remind you again that this is all on the HDB website. This video is on sales, on outdoor sales, but it is just as relevant for every age group of pig. So what compound feed to use? Okay, this is the nitty gritty for you guys, I realise, so I shall try and slow myself down. Types of feed. Okay. I know you've probably seen these, but I just wanted to go through them as I see them as a nutritionist, okay? A wiener pig. This is the wiener diet for your young pigs, probably just before you wean them and for a few weeks afterwards, maybe up to 10 weeks of age, maybe not. It just depends how well your pigs are growing, what body condition score they've got, and how well they're eating and what else you've got being fed to them. 
It is a high protein diet. It has to be high protein because they've got an awful lot of muscle to lay down and they've got very small tummies, okay? High energy, it has to be high energy. They're exceptionally small creatures, small pigs. They spend a lot of energy keeping warm. They spend a lot of energy running around, if you, just like children. And they need that energy to put towards laying down protein, laying down some fat. Don't forget from our, one of our first charts, they're growing stomach mass, they're growing intestines. They've got an awful lot of biological work to do. And that all takes energy. And as you probably remember from before, if it's high energy that we want, we want a low fiber. We've got a very small stomach, so we don't want to fill it up with extra fiber. We want them to be working really hard at laying um, down protein and some fat and growing really well. These guys have the lowest fee conversion ratio that you're ever gonna get. So it's the best growth rate you're ever going to get. So this is the crucial part to get right. If you remember when we talked about co-products, we said to feed 75% of the diet should be probably compound at this stage. And this is why, because it's the best FCR you're gonna get. It's the best food conversion that you can get. Okay, grower diet, maybe 10 to 15 weeks of age, okay. Medium protein, medium energy, medium fiber. We've still got good growth rates at this grower stage. We've still got good um, fee conversion rate, really, at this stage. The feed intake is not huge. So we're feeding them to still be laying down that protein. The fat deposition hasn't fully taken off yet. So we're making the most. We're starting to try and cash in on the, on the growth rate while we can at this stage. Finish a diet. 15 weeks plus. If they're getting fat on the grower diet, push them onto a finisher diet a bit quicker because you're just feeding them a bit too much. Low protein, because they're eating so much, they should be able to meet their requirements. It's low energy because they're just not, they're starting to lay down the fat. So we don't want them to lay excess fat. It's high fiber because they're much bigger animals. They've got that gut fill. They need satiety. They need to feel full. So at this stage, it's all about controlling fat deposition and maintaining some of the lean growth where we can. So why feed a weaner diet? Because it's expensive, isn't it? Why feed it? Well, one of the main reasons, we've got a lovely big circle here, vitamins and minerals. This is really important for your lactating, um, for your breeding stock coming forwards. We need really good muscle and bone, uh, sorry, we need really good bone development in these piglets, not just for those that are going to be reproducing, but throughout their lives to get them to finish. Most of you will be producing in um, extensive conditions. So there's going to be a lot of movement of the pig. They're going to be doing quite a lot of running around. They might be riding each other if they're in mixed sexes. They might be um, running through mud. They need a sound, bone structure, okay? They also need a good health. Although you're on um, uh, extensive systems, you know, they're exposed to more weather conditions. Um, they're in maybe mixing with their own feces. We have to give them every opportunity to be as healthy as possible. And they've got a high metabolic rate. That means their bodies are doing a lot of work with all of the growing of the intestines and everything. So we need to provide the vitamins to help them achieve those things. Amino acids. I don't know how much people know about amino acids, but the amino acids are the building bricks of protein, okay? So protein is basically chains and chains of amino acid. And when you're building muscle, like in my muscle pig here, basically he's laying down these little bricks of amino acids. And if you think of the white bits, the mortar as the energy, it's going to have energy in between. Um, so amino acids are really crucial at this stage because we've got a lot of protein and gut development. So we're promoting our gut health. We're maintaining a really good protein deposition and we're giving them the tools, the building blocks to do that as quickly and as efficiently as possible. 
energy back to our Duracell batteries and these the little mortar in between our proteins. I love that slide, that's great. Um, we need this energy for the growth, for the deposition of fat and protein, and we need energy for maintaining health, okay? The wiener diet needs a really decent size AA battery in order to make the most of everything else that you're offering. If you don't have enough energy in the diet for the wiener pig, then there's no point feeding them the rest of it because they can't do anything with it. And lastly, we've got my Holland and Barrett effect. Um, it's the extras that you get from the diets. To me, these are really important. I know you probably don't think that us nutritionists think about these things, but you know, we think about them all the time. So the Holland and Barrett's, you might have enzymes in your diet which help um, digest phytate, which produces, releases more phosphorus from the cereals within your diet, which means that we have to put less into it as a diet. So there's less coming out the other end of your pig. Really important from a planetary health point of view. We might have more enzymes that will help release more energy and release more of these nutrients from the raw materials that we're putting into the diet. Again, really important. We're getting more from less and helping our planet. But we also put extras in that promote health. So you might see omega-3s in there and improve production levels. So to me, they might look like Mr. Magic and a little bit of Holland and Barrett, but as nutritionists, we do spend a lot of time researching and trying to find the right additives for your pigs and for all pigs to try and make the most of it. And the wiener diet, the FCR, I can't keep going on about this enough, I know I'm boring you, but the FCR is at the lowest point post weaning, in those weeks post weaning, it is the best and the most efficient growth rate you're going to get. So they deserve being treated in luxury, to, I, I think, at this stage. So the next question, why feed a grower? To be honest, exactly the same reasons as the weaner. But if any of you are astute enough to notice, these are a bit smaller. So the bits and minerals, a little bit less important. So they're a bit lower. The amino acids, a little bit smaller because it's a little bit less important because they're eating more. They're doing a little bit more of it on their own. Energy, again, a little bit lower. Appetites are growing gut capacity increasing, stomach size is increasing, pigs are starting to get greedy. Time to control this energy level so that we're not getting excessive fat deposition. And again, the Holland and Barrett. This is the only, Holland and Barrett has shrunk, but the planet is the only thing that has stayed the same size on this slide, mainly because these things are all helping us maintain the planet as well as the Holland and Barrett effect. So the enzymes and the extras that you get in those diets are really helping with that. And remember, the FCR is still good at this stage. We still have to be cashing in on the cheap growth rate. And then, yeah, you've got to guess that why feed finished diets? <laughs> Look, they've got little tiny pictures here now, but they're all still the same. They're all still doing the same job. They're giving you the basics. They're giving you the building blocks. Just look at that little battery. Um, they're all still growing, but they're doing a lot of it. There's less and less in the diet because the pigs are eating more and more of it. So it's not that the pigs are getting less. It's the fact that there's less in the diet because they're eating more of the diet. But still, we've got that little bit of Holland and Barrett effect with a lovely big planetary effect. Because we have to remember now we've got high feed intake and low FCR. Okay, so we've got to control all of these things. Okay, so what ifs? Okay, what ifs? I struggled to think of these things for what ifs because it was all pretty obvious to me. So uh, Tony and Marcus have been very helpful and have helped me out and we've come up with a few. I'm sure there may be more. What if I feed a grower diet to a wiener pig? Well, 
I'm not really sure that's a good idea to me. And I'm going to try and explain to you why. If we feed a grower diet to a weaner pig, when it's down here, we're going to slow this bit of growth rate. So we're aiming for a pig D here, aren't we? Okay. If we feed the grower diet, which had those smaller icons because it's got less energy and it can't eat anymore, that small pig, because it's not got the stomach size, we're basically pushing it further and further along. So instead of it having a growth rate of A, of D, sorry, probably won't even have a growth rate of A. We might be moving it to E or maybe even an F. The other concern I've got is that we will probably be pushing, if we've got a lovely winged pig of condition score three, we're probably going to push it to a body condition score, score two because it's not got enough of anything in that diet to be able to grow effectively and at speed. So we're going to increase the time to finish. It will increase the feed conversion ratio. It will decrease the daily live weight gain. And we saw that on our FCR slide. We're at increased risk of poor body condition score, moving down to a two. And it's going to increase the amount of feed we require to finish. I'm going to explain that a bit more to you later, this, this section here. So if we're saying that this pig is going to take longer to finish, okay, let's say it's going to, I've made a few assumptions here to try and explain to you how the thinking works. If it takes an extra three weeks to finish that pig, to reach its finishing wage, weight, which it could well do because we've pushed it from a D over to an F or a G, it, we're gonna have to feed it extra feed. Okay, so if a pig eats three kilograms of feed per day, yeah, but we're going to say it takes three weeks, it's going to eat 21 kilograms of feed extra in a week. That's a lot of food. That's a bag of food here, for this one pig. So three kilos a day, that's 21 kilos in a week. I'm hoping some of you are really good at maths because that's 63 kilos of feed over three weeks just to try and get it to finish. So that's an extra three 20 kilo bags of feed to get it to finish that we probably wouldn't have needed if we'd have fed it the weaner diet. What if I feed a finisher diet to a grower and a weaner? Well, it's, it's exactly the same actually. I'm, I'm sure most of you will have known that, but instead of it being an F or a G, it's probably a J, a K or an L. It's probably over here somewhere by then. It's high fiber, a finisher diet. It's designed for large volumes of intake. These wiener pigs, they just can't eat enough of that food to benefit from it. So we're gonna end up with our three pig going down to a one pig. And we've already said this is gonna take longer to finish. It's an increased time to finish. It's an increased FCR, it's growing slower, it's poor body condition score. And worryingly, they, do get, they are at more risk from disease. And again, it's going to increase the amount of food required to finish. I'm going to run through this example again because I just can't say it enough times. So we're gonna say if we're feeding a finisher diet instead of the grower diet, we're probably gonna take an extra six weeks to finish this pig off, okay? Do it again, so three kilos of feed a day, that's 21 feet kilos of food a week, and that's 126, that's six extra bags of feed, that's a hell of a lot of feed. I couldn't even be bothered to put all those dots on. That's a lot of feed. So is it really worth feeding a wean diet? Well, yes, I really think it is. But then you're probably gonna say, she's bound to say that because she's a nutritionist. Yeah, true, I probably am. So I thought I'd better try and show you what. So I've run three very simple examples for you. We're gonna look at test one. We feed a wiener diet, a grower diet, and a finisher diet. Test two, we're just gonna feed the grower diet and the finisher diet. Test three, we're just gonna look at the finisher diet. 
Okay. And what we're going to do to test these is we're just going to look at the very basic principles that we looked at earlier in our talk. So the fee conversion ratio and the live weight. Okay. So let's look at test one. Okay. So these are the diets, Wiener Grower Finisher. 20 kilogram bag. I've, I kind of, I, I don't know what you guys pay for your feed. So I had a quick look online and came up with these prices. So 16 pounds for a bag of Wiener diet. 13 pounds for a bag of grower diet and 11 bag, pounds for a bag of finisher diet. Okay, we're going to make that because it's a lot easier for me and it's the way we ought to be doing it. Convert that into pounds per kilogram of feed. So that's just the cost of 20 kilogram bag over 20 to give you a cost per kilo. Okay, so 80 pence for one kilo of wiener diet, 65 pence for one kilo of grower diet and 55 pence for one kilogram of finisher. Obviously, the wean is more expensive and the finisher is cheaper. So we're going to take a guess at the fee conversion ratios of the pigs that we're growing in this stage. Okay, So we're going to go for a two to one fee conversion ratio. So if you remember, that means two kilograms of feed to create one kilogram of live weight, two and a half for the grower and three for the finisher. Pretty optimistic, but why not? So we're going to go for a live weight gain in these sections. So 10 kilo live weight gain, hef hefty growth in this wiener. We're really going for pushing them along. 25 kilos of growth in the grower stage and 30 kilos of growth in the finished phase. OK, this is just me making an imaginary scenario. So then we have to calculate how much feed this pig is going to require. And if you remember, we're going to do live weight gain multiplied by the feed conversion ratio, because it's two kilos gram feed in to make one kilogram of pig. So that makes 20 kilograms of feed required of the wiener, 62 and a half kilograms of the grower, and 90 kilos of the finisher. So then all we're going to do is the cost of the feed. So how many kilograms multiplied by the pound per kilogram? So that gives us a total cost of 106 pounds and 13p. Are you all with me so far? Okay, so then let's look at test two. These are the same, the feed costs are the same. The FCRs. Now, from everything that we've talked about, these are not going to be the same. They can't be the same because we're asking to the pigs to achieve something different with something different. So I've put these up just by half of the feed conversion ratio. Again, Tony told me I was very optimistic and that he would expect them to go up more, but I've been, I like to be an optimist. So we've gone for a fee conversion. It was 2.5, so I've lifted it up to 3. And the finisher, it was 3, and I've lifted it up to 3.5. Okay, so the live weight gain we're expecting now is 35 because we're not gaining 10 kilos here, so we've got to gain it here because we're going to do it all with the grower diet. Okay. I know that you guys who are good at maths are going to be in front of me here, but this is now 30 kilos of feed. So now we're going to require 105 kilos of grower, which is fine and fair enough because we're feeding it to the wings as well. But we're also now going to require 105 kilos of finishing, which was more than we required before. We're again doing the basic maths. That's now costing us £126 per pig to complete this, uh, to finish this pig. That's £20 more than test one when we fed it a good dose of wiener diet, 10 kilos of wiener diet, 20 kilos even it got. Huge difference. Okay, and then we're going to just do it on test three where we're just feeding the finished diet. So again, increase the FCR by 0.5. So on the first one, we did three, then we did 3.5, now we're four. Uh, again, Tony's told me this is very optimistic. He would expect to be a lot more, but we're going to run with my example because it's a lot more optimistic. So live weight gain, it's got to do all its live weight gain in that, with that one diet. So it's now going to need 260. It was only 210 kilos on the last slide, 260 kilos of feed, which is 143 pounds per pig. 
So in summary, we've got, and this is all, oh, this is only very basic. It doesn't, you know, it, it's, it's a very simple test. It's making a lot of assumptions, I realise. I just want to highlight, this is just so cheap because you've got all that cheap fee conversion ratio. Yes, it's an expensive diet, but the pig is doing the work with it. Feeding this finisher to this wiener pig, there is not enough in it. Even if you're co-product feeding, you should not be feeding a finisher diet to your pig. There is not enough in it to work with. Even if you are co-product feeding, I really don't want you to feed a grower diet to your pig. There's not enough in it. The wiener diet, go for it. That is the way forward. Co-product feed, yes, absolutely, go for it. But this wiener phase, a fee conversion ratio is the best thing that we can chase for, okay? So now I've rammed back down your throats. Um, what if I want to use alternative feeds? Well, you know, I'm all about that. And yes, go for it. This was the slide of the, our previous um, presentation. Just remember, wieners, high energy, high protein, low fiber, exactly the same as in the compound diet. Growers, medium energy, medium protein, medium fiber, exactly the same as in the compound diet. Finishers, low energy, low protein, high fiber. Um, I've put medium in there because we were talking about the amounts um, in the previous, uh, how early they might go on to it, but exactly the same as the compound diet. And the other thing, if you, no matter what you're feeding, whether it's um, alternative co-products or compound diets, we must be aiming for our target of three. Now, I know that you've all seen this before from the previous one, but I just want to reiterate, if the pig is a condition score one, it is not got enough energy. It is not on the right diet. So when I'm talking about this on our previous presentation, it's not just the co-products that we're talking about here. We are also talking about the concentrates, the compound feed. If your pig is a condition score number one, it is on the wrong diet. It is not getting enough food. It is not getting enough energy, okay? If you are feeding it a lot of fibre, you need to cut that down. And that would be if it was a finisher diet because they are high fibre or a co-product. If your pig is condition score number five, you must increase the fiber and decrease the energy. Okay, very simple. The same for co-product feeding and for compound feeding. And when we talk about co-product feeding, you need to do both at the same time with your co-product co and your compound, if you can. So what does it cost me if I feed them wrong? I'm hoping that we've shown you that from this slide before. It's adding the conversion ratio. It's adding daily live weight gain, uh, decreasing daily live weight gain. It's taking much longer to finish them. We're having to use a lot more food, which isn't really the way forward, either for yourselves on a profit point of view or from a sustainability point of view. Okay. So I know I've rammed home about um, FCRs, so um, Marcus and Tony quite right said, but what else can I do to use um, food efficiently? Absolutely right, very good point. So I direct you back to our FCR slide that AHDB kindly provided for us. Welfare status, are they clean? Are they dry? Do they have access to water, a clean fresh water all the time? Gut health, weight at weaning, management systems, all of these things. And I've put together some of my key ones for you. I know you knew that was coming, didn't you? Body condition score number three, health. We must maintain the health of these pigs at all costs. Poorly pigs eat food. They might need antibiotics, which we, you know, we're trying hard not to do. And a healthy pig grows more efficiently. It lays down a better ratio of protein and fat. It gives you a much better end product to sell. Clean fresh water. I'm hoping that that slide where we showed you how much protein is made up of water will encourage you to make sure that they have access to clear, clean, fresh water all day, every day. 
even in wet weather when they're drinking the puddle of water, you should still provide clean, fresh water. Bin storage, you know, making sure you've got food, the, the animal food stored in the correct containers away from these guys. These guys can push your SCR up massively because they eat no end. Ask anybody that was in Australia trying to keep pigs during the um, epidemic of um, rodents. These should be kept under control. Also from a health point of view, leptospirosis, awful, awful for pigs, particularly when they're outdoors. Moldy feed, these bins should be kept dry, okay? Keeping your feed dry in this winter weather and cool as much as you possibly can in summer weather. Mold increases FCR, it reduces daily feed intake, it reduces daily live weight gain, and it can make your pigs very poor, okay? Feed, I love that picture, that's a lovely picture. I'd really love to see all pigs fed in a trough where the feed can't be snouted out. It's very difficult, your pigs are exceptionally good at snouting feed out, and I know it looks good to have them rooting through ground mud, but it's such a waste of food and we can't afford that in this world, in the modern world, or even in a sustainable world, okay? And then the last few bits um, uh, of what else can we do for efficiency is this weather, okay? Your pigs are generally kept in more extensive conditions. So wind and rain are our enemy, okay? It reduces pigs' temperature it reduces your temperature, it also reduces the pig's temperature. It means that they're spending a lot more energy, a lot more of those batteries, just on keeping warm. Sudden changes in temperature, pigs don't like. Um, they're all right with cold weather. Wind and rain is more difficult, but cold weather is all right, but it's the fluctuation. So we've just been through where we've had hot days and cold nights. And the best way that I can explain it to you is if you go from a hot room out into the cold, you really feel that cold. The same in the summer, if you go out um, when you land on your exotic holiday to the likes of Greece or um, Portugal or wherever you may go, um, when you step off that plane, you go, oh, it's really hot. But by the time you get back on the plane to go home, you don't even notice that temperature. Pigs are the same. So in cold weather, it's that temperature fluctuation downwards. Snow I've got in here, making sure that your pigs have got access to water in freezing cold weather. Snow itself acts as an insulator. It's great, it's fine. But can they get to the food? Can they get to the water? Can they find the food? Can they find the water? And this is just wet mud, I should have put really, but wet and mud and great in the summer, awful in the winter. I'm sure most of you know that. And I know pigs are generally up to their elbows in mud but it means that they're spending a lot more time and a lot more energy moving and moving around and keeping warm. So trying to keep them as dry and as warm as possible to create food efficiency. So what else can I do? I'm sorry, this is my most boring slide, but it always seems really boring to everybody. Data recording. It's really important how you can make a decision on how to improve when you don't know where you are mystifies me. We should all be starting with the basics. When we have new customers here at Kingsgate, it's the first thing we start asking about. What's the weight coming in? What weight are they going out at? How many days are they on the unit? How much food are they using? And from those basic pieces of data, we can work out those pieces of information that we've used earlier. What's the daily live weight gain? What's the feed conversion ratio? And how much are they actually eating every day? So to me, all businesses need information to make decisions and pigs are no different. In fact, they're more important because we, there are so many influences that, that we saw from the FCR charts that have an impact on every single thing that we do. But the more comprehension, the more understanding, the more records we keep of those pigs, the better. So that's it, that's me. Have we got any questions?